a reading of the Timaeus by Plato, translated by Thomas Taylor. The persons of the dialogue are Socrates, Timaeus, Critias, and Hermocrates. Socrates opens the dialogue. I see one, two, three, but where, friend Timaeus, is that fourth person who, being received by me yesterday at a banquet of disputation, ought now in his turn to repay me with a similar repast? Timaeus. He labors, Socrates, under a certain infirmity, for he would not willingly be absent from such an association as the present, Socrates. It remains, therefore, for you, O Timaeus, and the company present to fill up the part of this absent guest. Timocrates. Entirely so, Socrates. And we shall endeavor to the utmost of our ability to leave nothing belonging to such an employment unaccomplished. For it would be by no means just that we, who were yesterday entertained by you, in such a manner as guests ought to be received, should not return the hospitality with readiness and delight. Socrates. Do you recollect the magnitude and nature of the things which I proposed to you to explain? Timaeus. Some things, indeed, I recollect, but such as I have forgotten, do you recall into my memory? Or rather, if it be not too much trouble, run over the whole in a cursory manner from the beginning, that it may be more firmly established in our memory. Socrates. Let it be so. And to begin, the sum of yesterday's dispute was what kind of republic appeared to me to be the best, and from what sort of men such a republic ought to be composed. Timaeus. And by us indeed, Socrates, all that you said was approved in the highest degree. Socrates. Did we not in the first place separate husbandmen and other artificers from those whom we considered as the defenders of the city? Timaeus. Certainly. Socrates. And when we had assigned to every one that which was accommodated to his nature, and had prescribed only one particular employment to every particular art, we likewise assigned to the military tribe one province only, I mean that of protecting the city, and this as well from the hostile incursions of internal as of external enemies. But yet in such a manner as to administer justice mildly to the subjects of their government, as being naturally friends, and to behave with warlike fierceness against their enemies 
in battle. Timaeus. Entirely so. Socrates. For we asserted, I think, that the souls of the guardians should be of such a nature as at the same time to be both irascible and philosophic in a remarkable degree, so that they might be gentle to their friends and bold and ferocious to their enemies. Timaeus, you did so. Socrates, but what did we assert concerning their education? Was it not that they should be instructed in gymnastic exercises, in music, and other becoming disciplines? Timaeus, entirely so. Socrates, we likewise established that those who were so educated should neither consider golden or silver or any goods of a similar kind as their own private property, but that rather, after the manner of adjutants, they should receive the wages of guardianship from those whom they defend and preserve, and that their recompense should be no more than is sufficient to a moderate subsistence. That, besides this, they should use their public stipend in common, and for the purpose of procuring a common subsistence with each other, so that, neglecting every other concern, they may employ their attention solely on virtue and the discharge of their peculiar employment. Timaeus These things also were related by you. Socrates Of women, too, we asserted that they should be educated in such a manner as to be aptly conformed, similar to the natures of men, with whom they should perform in common both the duties of war and whatever else belongs to the business of life. Timaeus, this too was asserted by you. Socrates, but what did we establish concerning the procreation of children? Though perhaps you easily remember this on account of its novelty. For we ordered that the marriages and children should be common. As we were particularly careful that no one might be able to distinguish his own children, but that all might consider all as their kindred. And that hence those of an equal age might regard themselves as brothers and sisters, but that the younger might reverence the elder as their parents and grandfathers, and the elder might esteem the younger as their children and grandsons. Timaeus. These things, indeed, as you say, are easily remembered. Socrates. But that they might, from their birth, acquire a disposition, as far as possible the best, we decreed that the rulers whom we placed over the marriage rites should, through the means of certain lots, 
take care that in the nuptial league, the worthy were mingled with the worthy, that no discord may arise in this connection when it does not prove prosperous in the end, but that all the blame may be referred to fortune and not to the guardians of such a conjunction. Timaeus, we remember this likewise. Socrates, we also ordered that the children of the good should be properly educated, but that those of the bad should be secretly sent to some other city, yet so that such of the adult among these as should be found to be of a good disposition should be recalled from exile, while, on the contrary, those who were retained from the first in the city as good, but proved afterwards bad, should be similarly banished. Timaeus, just so. Socrates, have we therefore sufficiently epitomized yesterday's disputation, or do you require anything further, friend Timaeus, which I have omitted? Timaeus, nothing indeed, Socrates, for all this was the subject of your disputation. Socrates, Hear now how I am affected towards this republic which we have described. For I will illustrate the affair by a similitude. Suppose then that someone, on beholding beautiful animals, whether represented in a picture or really alive, but in a state of perfect rest, should desire to behold them in motion and struggling, as it were, to imitate those gestures which seem particularly adapted to the nature of bodies. In such a manner am I affected towards the form of that republic which we have described. For I should gladly hear anyone relating the contests of our city with other nations when it engages in a becoming manner in war and acts during such an engagement in a manner worthy of its institution, both with respect to practical achievements and verbal negotiations. For indeed, O Critias and Hermocrates, I am conscious of my own inability to praise such men and such a city according to their desert. Indeed, that I should be incapable of such an undertaking is not wonderful, since the same imbecility seems to have attended poets, both of the past and present age. Not that I despise the poetic tribe, but it appears from hence evident that as these kind of men are studious of imitation, they easily and in the best manner express things in which they have been educated, while on the contrary, whatever is foreign from their education they imitate with difficulty in actions and with still more difficulty in words. But with respect to the tribe of sophists, though I consider them as skilled both in the art of speaking and in many other illustrious arts, yet as they have no settled abode but wander daily through a multitude of cities, I am afraid lest, 
with respect to the institutions of philosophers and politicians, they should not be able to conjecture the quality and magnitude of those concerns which wise and political men are engaged in with individuals, in warlike undertakings, both in actions and in discourse. It remains, therefore, that I should apply to you, who excel in the study of wisdom and civil administration, as well naturally as through the assistance of proper discipline and institution. For Timaeus here of Locris, an Italian city governed by the best of laws, exclusive of his not being inferior to any of his fellow citizens in wealth and nobility, has arrived in his own city at the highest posts of government and honors. Besides, we all know that Critias is not ignorant of the particulars of which we are now speaking, nor is this to be doubted of Hermocrates, since a multitude of circumstances evince that he is both by nature and education adapted to all such concerns. Hence, when you yesterday requested me to dispute about the institution of a republic, I readily complied with your request, being persuaded that the remainder of the discourse could not be more conveniently explained by anyone than by you, if you were but willing to engage in its discussion. For unless you properly adapt the city for warlike purposes, there is no one in the present age from whom it can acquire everything becoming its constitution. As I have therefore hitherto complied with your request, I shall now require you to comply with mine in the above-mentioned particulars. Nor have you indeed refused this employment, but have with common consent determined to repay my hospitality with this banquet of discourse. I now, therefore, stand prepared to receive the promised feast. Hermocrates But we, O Socrates, as Timaeus just now signified, shall cheerfully engage in the execution of your desire, for we cannot offer any excuse sufficient to justify neglect in this affair. For yesterday, when we departed from hence and went to the lodging of Critias, where we are accustomed to reside, both in his apartment and prior to this in the way thither, we discoursed on this very particular. He therefore related to us a certain ancient history, which I wish, O Critias, you would now repeat to Socrates, that he may judge whether it any way conduces to the fulfillment of his request. Critias. It is requisite to comply, if agreeable to Timaeus, the third associate of our undertaking, Timaeus, I assent to your compliance. Critias. Hear then, O Socrates, a discourse, surprising indeed in the extreme, yet in every respect true, as it was once related by Solon, the most wise of the seven wise men. Solon, then, was the familiar and intimate friend of our great-grandfather Dropis, as he himself often relates in his poems. But he once declared to our grandfather Critias, as the old man himself informed us, that 
great and admirable actions had once been achieved by this city, which nevertheless were buried in oblivion, though length of time and the destruction of mankind. In particular, he informed me of one undertaking more illustrious than the rest, which I now think proper to relate to you, both that I may repay my obligations, and that by such a relation I may offer my tribute of praise to the goddess in the present solemnity by celebrating her divinity, as it were, with hymns, justly and in a manner agreeable to truth. Socrates, you speak well, but what is this ancient achievement which was not only actually related by Solon, but was once really accomplished by this city? Critias, I will acquaint you with that ancient history, which I did not indeed receive from a youth, but from a man very advanced in years. For at that time, Critias, as he himself declared, was almost ninety years old. I myself was about ten. When, therefore, that solemnity was celebrated among us, which is known by the name of Curiotis apaturiorum. Nothing was omitted which boys in that festivity are accustomed to perform, for when our parents had set before us the rewards proposed for the contest of singing verses, both a multitude of verses of many poets were recited, and many of us especially sung the poems of Solon because they were at that time entirely new. But then, one of our tribe, whether he was willing to gratify Critias, or whether it was his real opinion, affirmed that Solon appeared to him most wise in other concerns, and in things respecting poetry, the most ingenious of all poets. Upon hearing this, the old man, for I, I very well remember, was vehemently delighted and said, laughing, If Solon, O Aminander, had not engaged in poetry as a casual affair, but had made it, as others do, a serious employment, and if through seditions and other fluctuations of the state in which he found his country involved, he had not been compelled to neglect the completion of the history which he brought from Egypt. I do not think that either Hesiod or Homer or any other poet would have acquired greater glory and renown. In consequence of this, Amenander inquired of Critias, what that history was. To which he answered that it was concerning an affair, the greatest and most celebrated which this city ever performed. Though through length of time and the destruction of those by whom it was undertaken, the fame of its execution has not reached this present age. But I beseech you, O Critias, said Anamander, relate this affair from the beginning, and inform me what that event was which Solon asserted as a fact, and on what occasion, and from whom he received it. There is then, says he, a certain region of Egypt called Delta, about the summit of which the streams of the Nile are divided. In this place, a government is established called Saitical, 
and the chief city of this region of Delta is Sais, from which also King Amasis derived his origin. The city has a presiding divinity whose name is in the Egyptian tongue Neith, and in the Greek Athena or Minerva. These men were friends of the Athenians, with whom they declared they were very familiar through a certain bond of alliance. In this country, Solon, on his arrival there, was, as he himself relates, very honorably received. And upon his inquiring about ancient affairs of those priests who possessed a knowledge in such particulars superior to others, he perceived that neither himself nor any one of the Greeks, as he himself declared, had any knowledge of very remote antiquity. Hence, when he once desired to excite them to the relation of ancient transactions, he for this purpose began to discourse about those most ancient events which formerly happened among us. I mean the traditions concerning the first Foreneus and Niobe and after the deluge of Deucalion and Pyrrha, as described by the mythologists, together with their posterity, at the same time paying a proper attention to the different ages in which these events are said to have subsisted. But upon this, one of those more ancient priests exclaimed, O oh, Solon, Solon, you Greeks are always children, nor is there any such thing as an aged Grecian among you. But Solon, when he heard this, What, says he, is the motive of your exclamation? To whom the priest, Because all your souls are juvenile, neither containing any ancient opinion, derived from remote tradition, nor any discipline hoary from its existence in former periods of time. But the reason of this is the multitude and variety of destructions of the human race, which formerly have been, and again will be the greatest of these indeed arising from fire and water, but the lesser from ten thousand other contingencies. For the relation subsisting among you that Phaeton, the offspring of the sun, on a certain time attempting to drive the chariot of his father, and not being able to keep the track observed by his parent, burnt up the natures belonging to the earth, and perished himself, blasted by thunder, is indeed considered as fabulous, yet is, in reality, true. For it expresses the mutation of the bodies revolving in the heavens about the earth, and indicates that through long periods of time, a destruction of terrestrial natures ensues from the devastations of fire. Hence, those who dwell either on mountains or in lofty and dry places, perish more abundantly than those who dwell near rivers or on the borders of the sea. To us, indeed, the Nile is both 
salutary in other respects, and liberates us from the fear of such like depredations. But when the gods, purifying the earth by waters, deluge its surface, then the herdsmen and shepherds inhabiting the mountains are preserved, while the inhabitants of your cities are hurried away to the sea by the impetuous inundation of the rivers. On the contrary, in our region, neither then nor at any other time did the waters descending from on high pour with desolation on the plains. But they are naturally impelled upwards from the bosom of the earth. And from these causes, the most ancient traditions are preserved in our country. For indeed, it may be truly asserted that in those places where neither intense cold nor immoderate heat prevails, the race of mankind is always preserved. Though sometimes the number of individuals is increased and sometimes suffers a considerable diminution. But whatever has been transacted either by us or by you, or in any other place, beautiful or great, or containing anything uncommon, of which we have heard the report, everything of this kind is to be found described in our temples and preserved to the present day. While on the contrary, you and other nations commit only recent transactions to writing and to other inventions which society has employed for transmitting information to posterity. And so again, at stated periods of time, a certain celestial defluxion rushes on them like a disease, from whence those among you who survive are both destitute of literary acquisitions and the inspiration of the muses. Hence it happens that you become juvenile again and ignorant of the events which happened in ancient times, as well among us as in the regions which you inhabit. The transactions, therefore, O Solon, which you relate from your antiquities differ very little from puerile fables. For in the first place, you only mention one deluge of the earth, when at the same time many have happened. And in the next place, you are ignorant of a most illustrious and excellent race of men who once inhabited your country, from whence you and your whole city descended, though a small seed only of this admirable people once remained. But your ignorance in this affair is owing to the posterity of this people who were for many ages deprived of the use of letters and became, as it were, dumb. For prior, O Solon, to that mighty deluge which we have just mentioned, a city of Athenians existed, informed according to the best laws both in military concerns and every other duty of life, and whose illustrious actions and civil institutions are celebrated by us as the most excellent of all that have existed under the ample circumference of the heavens. And Solon, therefore, upon hearing this, said that he was astonished and burning with a most ardent desire entreated the priests 
to relate accurately all the actions of his ancient fellow citizens. And that afterwards, one of the priests replied, Nothing of envy, O Solon, prohibits us from complying with your request. But for your sake and that of your city, I will relate the whole, and especially on account of that goddess who is allotted the guardianship both of your city and ours, by whom they have been educated and founded, yours indeed by a priority to ours of a thousand years, receiving the seed of your race from Vulcan and the earth. But the description of the transactions of this, our city, during the space of 8,000 years is preserved in our sacred writings. I will therefore cursorily run over the laws and more illustrious actions of those cities which existed 9,000 years ago. For when we are more at leisure, we shall prosecute an exact history of every particular, receiving for this purpose the sacred writings themselves. In the first place, then, consider the laws of these people and compare them with ours. For you will find many things which then subsisted in your city similar to such as exist at present. For the priests passed their life separated from all others. The artificers also exercised their arts in such a manner that each was engaged in his own employment without being mingled with other artificers. The same method was likewise adopted with shepherds, hunters, and husbandmen. The soldiers, too, you will find, were separated from other kind of men and were commanded by the laws to engage in nothing but warlike affairs. A similar armor, too, such as that of shields and darts, was employed by each. These we first used in Asia, the goddess in those places, as likewise happened to you, first pointing them out to our use. You may perceive, too, from the beginning what great attention was paid by the laws to prudence and modesty, and besides this, to divination and medicine, as subservient to the preservation of health. And from these, which are divine goods, the laws, proceeding to the invention of such as are merely human, procured all such other disciplines as follow from those we have just enumerated. From such a distribution, therefore, and in such order, the goddess first established and adorned your city choosing for this purpose the place in which you were born, as she foresaw that from the excellent temperature of the region, men would arise distinguished by the most consummate sagacity and wit. For as the goddess is a lover both of wisdom and war, she fixed on a soil capable of producing men the most similar to herself, and rendered it in every respect adapted for the habitation of such a race. The ancient Athenians, therefore, using these laws, and being formed by good institutions, in a still higher degree than I have mentioned, inhabited this region surpassing all men in every virtue, as it becomes those to do 
who are the progeny and pupils of the gods. But though many and mighty deeds of your city are contained in our sacred writings and are admired as they deserve, yet there is one transaction which surpasses all of them in magnitude and virtue. For these writings relate what prodigious strength your city formerly tamed when a mighty warlike power rushing from the Atlantic Sea spread itself with hostile fury over all Europe and Asia. For at that time, the Atlantic Sea was navigable and had an island before that mouth which is called by you the Pillars of Hercules. But this island was greater than both Libya and all Asia together, and afforded an easy passage to other neighboring islands. And it was likewise easy to pass from those islands to all the continent which borders on the Atlantic Sea. For the waters which are beheld within the mouth, which we just now mentioned, have the form of a bay with a narrow entrance, but the mouth itself is a true sea. And lastly, the earth which surrounds it is in every respect truly denominated the continent. In this Atlantic island, a combination of kings was formed who, with mighty and wonderful power, subdued the whole island, together with many other islands and parts of the continent, and besides this, subjected to their dominion all Libya as far as to Egypt, and Europe as far as to the Tyrrhenian Sea. And when they were collected in a powerful league, they endeavored to enslave all our regions and yours. And besides this, all those places situated within the mouth of the Atlantic Sea. And then it was, O Solon, that the power of your city was conspicuous to all men for its virtue and strength. For as its armies surpassed all others both in magnanimity and military skill, so with respect to its contests, whether it was assisted by the rest of the Greeks, over whom it presided in warlike affairs, or whether it was deserted by them through the incursions of the enemies and became situated in extreme danger, yet still it remained triumphant. In the meantime, those who were not yet enslaved, it liberated from danger and procured the most ample liberty for all those of us who dwell within the pillars of Hercules. But in succeeding time, prodigious earthquakes and deluges taking place and bringing with them desolation in the space of one day and night, all that warlike race of Athenians was at once merged under the earth. And that Atlantic island itself, being absorbed in the sea, entirely disappeared. And hence, that sea is at present innavigable, arising from the gradually impeding mud which the subsiding island produced. And this, O Socrates, is the sum of what the elder Critias repeated from the narration of Solon. 
But when yesterday you were discoursing about a republic and its citizens, I was surprised on recollecting the present history. For I perceived how divinely from a certain fortune, and not wandering from the mark, you collected many things agreeing with the narration of Solon. Yet I was unwilling to disclose these particulars immediately, as from the great interval of time since I first received them, my remembrance of them was not sufficiently accurate for the purpose of repetition. I considered it therefore necessary that I should, first of all, diligently revolve the whole in my mind. And on this account, I yesterday immediately complied with your demands, for I perceived that we should not want the ability of presenting a discourse accommodated to your wishes, which in things of this kind is of principal importance. In consequence of this, as Hermocrates has informed you, immediately as we departed from hence by communicating these particulars with my friends here present, for the purpose of refreshing my memory and afterwards revolving them in my mind by night, I nearly acquired a complete recollection of the affair. And indeed, according to the proverb, what we learn in childhood abides in the memory with a wonderful stability. For with respect to myself, for instance, I am not certain that I could recollect the whole of yesterday's discourse. Yet I should be very much astonished in, if anything should escape my remembrance which I had heard in some past period of time, very distant from the present. Thus, as to the history which I have just now related, I received it from the old man with great pleasure and delight, who on his part very readily complied with my request and frequently gratified me with a repetition. And hence, as the marks of letters deeply burnt in remain indelible, so all these particulars became firmly established in my memory. In consequence of this, as soon as it was day, I repeated the narration to my friends, that together with myself they might be better prepared for the purposes of the present association. But now, with respect to that for which this narration was undertaken, I am prepared, O Socrates, to speak not only summarily, but so as to descend to the particulars of everything which I heard. But the citizens and city which you fabricated yesterday as in a fable, we shall transfer to reality, considering that city which you established as no other than this Athenian city, and the citizens which you conceived as no other than those ancestors of ours described by the Egyptian priest. And indeed, the affair will harmonize in every respect, nor will it be foreign from the purpose to assert that your citizens are those very people who existed at that time. Hence, Distributing the affair in common among us, we will endeavor, according to the utmost of our ability, to accomplish in a becoming manner the employment which you have assigned us. It is requisite, therefore, to consider, O Socrates, whether this discourse is reasonable or whether we should lay it aside and seek after 
another. 